Welcome to the Upshot, Old Zero Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the publisher, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. We're back for a Tuesday episode. We're sorry we missed you last week. I, I got a bunch of emails. People seem to be enjoying the twice a week format, which is great. But now, Josh, we, we can't we can't miss these Tuesday Thursdays or then people don't have something to listen to on their commute. So it's like really up to us to bring it every week, twice a week. We mostly will, unless there's holidays. We can't promise everything. <laughs> it was a holiday. It was a holiday, you animals. Settle down. You're fine. <laughs> uh, so I have, a, I have a couple stories I want to share with you, Josh, before we get into the Des Moines okay. Challenge, which we will talk about. Uh, so I had to, uh, I was broadcasting an ultimate Frisbee game on Friday. So I went to the barber, make sure I was looking good for television. And, uh, my barber, he's, his, his dad ran the barbershop here in my neighborhood in New York in Inwood, uh, for like 40 years or something. And then he took over. He's about my age, uh, Italian guy, just awesome guy. Like we're, we're we're like borderline friends outside of the barbershop because he lives in the neighborhood so like i saw him at a knicks game and so like we we know each other pretty well he like i've been going there for years he knows that i do disc sports stuff i mean he doesn't really know anything about them but he knows that i have a website about this stuff so uh he's like you know i'm getting my hair cut and he's like hey did you see that 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 disc golf shot i was like oh like the 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 crazy he's like yeah yeah i was like i was watching it on sports center and so he's he's talking about the shot having seen it on on the top 10 on sports center you know i didn't bring it up i didn't say anything about the world championships nothing and i i told him i was like i was there i was like 30 feet behind the basket <laughs> and like we were talking and then the other barber chimes in he's like oh yeah i love disc golf like i go play in connecticut sometimes and I, i'm just like disc golf is the, the the pace is still red, red hot like i i think the sport's still growing a lot right now like i i keep waiting for things to kind of cool off and instead i have my barber talking to me about disc golf uh unprompted at the barbershop and then later in the weekend i go to my buddy's bachelorette uh, bachelorette bachelor party and <laughs> he brings up the 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 shot He's talking about James Conrad. He's like, man, it was crazy. Outside in. like, And so then I'm talking with them about it. And I show the rest of the the party the the shot on my phone because some of them hadn't seen it. And then uh, I was with my wife's family a little bit over the weekend. And one of them brought up the shot. Okay, so when you... I think sometimes it's easy to be like, yeah, like, you know, sports center top 10, like that's cool, but whatever. But the, the regularity of being, uh, sort of shown something starts to normalize it in a way Mm -hmm. that you can't quite match. And I, you know, I've seen people getting all worked up about the fact that that crazy guy with the flag shorts is running around with no shirt on. Like it's such an unprofessional look for disc golf. And I'm like, y'all watch sports. Like, (laughs) <laughs> there was like naked streakers running on the field on a regular basis. Like I think that happened during the the Euro Cup final yesterday. Um, so I don't know. Like to me, I I think it's you know if people are going to get worked up about that and be like, oh look at all these drunk stoners, which you know Scott Van Pelt did talk about how drunk everybody was. Uh, you know the thing is over time that chips away. Think about how much different mm-hmm. it is now than it was like 10 years ago when people just like didn't even take it seriously at all. And now people are like, Oh wow. And you know, I bring up, you know, at the bachelor party, I was like, Hey, uh, yeah, Paul Macbeth, you know, like I set the scene for them so they could understand the context of the shot and why it was so important. And I was like, yeah, Paul Macbeth is a 10 year, $10 million endorsement contract. And like people's jaws hit the floor, but like stuff like that makes people realize that it's legit. And they see it on Sports Center, and like, then people pick it up. Um, I went out and watched a Bucks game last night. Nice win, Bucks. And I, didn't think they had it in them. Come on, they've been doing. I it thought I thought the Suns were going to roll them, man. They've been doing it. 
<laughs> series doesn't start until the home team loses, Josh. Keep that in mind. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I was mentioning some disc golf stuff to him, and he's like, "Yeah, like I went home, and now all my high school friends play disc golf and are obsessed." <laughs> and it's just things are happening right now. It's crazy, uh, and it's it's pretty exciting to see. But yeah, the the Sports Center James Conrad clip got a lot of traction. More. I, I never had people mentioning the Philo Albatross to me a couple of years ago. And I, I don't know if if that's just because it was a different time or, you know, more people are watching Sports Center lately. I don't even know. But like some of the people who mentioned it to me aren't even big sports fans. So it's just like it was coming across people's feeds. I I, I mean, I think if you look at Reddit, if you look at Twitter, the amount of traffic that it's gotten has just been exceptional and so even very loose sports fans who wouldn't call themselves huge sports fans are finding it in their social media finding it in other places that normally a sports center top 10 wouldn't make it so yeah i i think it really did have a big impact on our sport disc golf subreddit uh one of the moderators made a post normally this summer the subreddit has been averaging about 175 new subscribers per day and about 250,000 page views, which is pretty impressive numbers just on its own. <laughs> but then on June 27th, they got 1,231 new subscribers and had almost 800,000 page views. So that's just the immediate effect. And, uh, you know, it's it, that shot could reverberate for some time. Pretty cool. All right, let's get into Thank this you, Des Moines challenge. And a, a weird tournament, a weird weekend. Like, in some ways, it's nice to have an event where everyone's kind of just like, we're going to play, but like, it's not going to be a, that big of a deal. You know, like, we're just going to go out there and we're going to play. Like, Jomez didn't show up. Uh, <laughs> you know, a bunch of guys dropped last minute, probably because of the weather or just because they needed a, an extra break. Um, but it, I mean, it ended up being quite compelling. We have some exciting, uh, a, an exciting new face at the top of the leaderboard in FPO. And so really quick, let's just run down the scores, uh, over in MPO. Paul Macbeth has now won seven. Well, let me count it up. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. No, make it eight, eight straight tournaments following the world championships he's done it since 2014 and he added another one this year to make it eight in a row he wins the des moines challenge by two strokes over calvin heimberg gavin rathbun finishing in third place one shot back of calvin raven newsom in fourth and ben calloway uh in a tie for fourth with raven so that's your top five in mpo over in fpo Missy Gannon gets her first ever Elite Series win. She's been on the cusp so many times. We've talked about it earlier this year. She goes out there. She gets the win. Only two rounds of competition in FPO because of significant weather delays over the first two days of the tournament. Um, but Missy Gannon comes away with a one-stroke win over Jessica Weiss. Paige Pierce, Kristen Tatar tied for third, and Katrina Allen in solo fifth so that is your top five in fpo and congratulations to missy gannon for getting the win and let's start with missy gannon this is a player josh that has been very competitive consistently finishing inside the top 10 often inside the top five uh you know but hasn't very often put pressure on you know actually trying to win in a tournament and you know, we got to talk about the two round thing, but she comes away. She gets the win. Uh, to me, this is like kind of cements her as one of the best players on tour. And she may not be a player that can win on all styles of courses. She may not be a player that's going to compete for, uh, you know, winning elite series events week in and week out, but very consistent. And, you know, now gets to to add the trophy to the shelf. Very nice trophy, by the way, from the Des Moines Challenge, and uh, just it seems like a it's got it's just got to be very satisfying and gratifying for Missy to get 
to get a win after the grind of the last few years. And I'm sure for her, because if if I'm not mistaken, they were told at least prior to the second round or early in the second round that, you know, because of the delays, I know some rounds were cut in half, that that was going to be the they only round. They knew before round. the so, final day that it was going okay, to be. Okay, yeah. So whatever, however many holes she played at that point, I mean, she still had to make that big putt on 18. So like it, it, it for her, it has to feel like, uh, you know, a win. My question for you, Charlie, is... Which storyline do you think we see emerge in the months that follow this win? Because I see two that are possible. The first one is I see a Chris Dickerson storyline where, you know, always near the top, but never, never really contending. You know, he usually took himself out in day two uh, or day one back and then the second place you know, on Sunday uh, and played himself back into second place. Right. <clears throat> and then gets the win at USDGC and really cements himself as like one of the top five guys. And then, you know, playing well at Worlds, etc. So, you know, I think there's the Chris Dickerson storyline that Missy Gannon, in terms of her results, have mirrored well. But on the flip side, I think of another player who is, uh, you know, won a two-round tournament due to get a tournament getting cut short. And everyone was like, oh, is this like their breakout time? Like, are they going to cement themselves in the top 10? And that is Colton Montgomery at Waco last year when the tournament got cut short because of COVID. Uh, and then since then... I mean, Colton, I don't know if he's had a top 10 finish at a Pro Tour event. So, you know, and I'm not saying I think Missy Gannon will continue to be competitive, but also, I mean, relative to the depths of the FPO and MPO field, top 5 to 10 on FPO, top 20 in MPO. I mean, not there is. it's it, She's playing well, but don't get me wrong. But which, which of the storylines do you think we see emerge from this weekend? I don't think either is exactly right. Uh, okay. I, 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 I we'll get into the stats because I think it's important to note that when we talk about this, but I don't see Missy is going on some kind of Chris Dickerson like tear to finish the year, but I also don't think she's going to be irrelevant, which, you know, let's be honest, Cold Montgomery hasn't really been relevant in the it, 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 at a tournament, you know, towards the finish in quite a while. Um, I, I think she's somewhere in between those two things where. Really, I expect her to do more of what she's been doing, which is finishing like sixth, fourth, not really competing for the top. But then again, you know, we're going to be on more disc golf courses now and we're going to get off the the super bomber courses that I don't think favor her game. Um, so, so somewhere in between those two things, I think I, I, I wouldn't put it past her to win another Elite Series event at some point. You know, I think she showed this. This was a distillation of how she can win not a lot of mistakes putting solid and you know avoiding out of bounds and when you look at the and when you look at the stats what you see is that of players in the top five she had the lowest birdie percentage but the difference was that she only bogeyed on six percent of holes while other players were you know Jessica Wiesen, second, 14%. Paige Pearson, third, 22%. You know, as as is often the case, Paige Pierce is getting a lot of birdies, but she's also taking a lot of bogeys. Um, And so, you know, Missy Gannon isn't really giving herself as many looks at birdie as many of the other players, but she was scrambling effectively and she was hitting her putts. She's 100% on day one inside the circle. So... That to me is like the, the 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 way for her to win. The problem is that's not a high ceiling strategy. That's very much a, you know, avoid mistakes, get the birdies you can, and hope that your competitors who are more likely to birdie than you make more mistakes, which worked. Would it have worked if there was a third round? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, she ended up winning by one, and you you can't. It's hard to counterfactual with, you know, would it have been a one stroke lead only if there were going to be three rounds? Maybe not. I mean, the pressure is totally different. The decision making is different down the stretch. Uh, so I think it, it's hard to say, but given the caliber of players around her on the leaderboard within a stroke or two, it's not hard to imagine that she would not have held on through three rounds, but did through two. And I think you could say the same thing about Cole Montgomery at Waco in 2020, where it's like, Macbeth was right there and 
you know, can you match another insane round like you had? Maybe. But at the end of the day, it's a win. Everybody was playing by the same rules. Everybody knew the situation. It's not like they canceled the third round at the last minute. It was just a weird weekend. And Missy Gannon took advantage by playing very smart, solid golf uh, and dealing with all of the weird delays. I mean, there were some serious, serious thunderstorms coming through the area, like absolutely unplayable conditions, crazy hail. Uh, Jacob Wilkins, resident Ulti World Disc Golf meteorologist, was sharing some I- images and radar on uh, Twitter. And it was there was a there was a video like time lapse of the storm that was coming in, and it was it looked apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and maybe that's another factor that we need to consider is that Missy Gannon's consistency means that she's able to weather inclement weather. Uh, better than other players. If she knows her shots, knows her discs, knows what they're going to do, even in, as you put it, apocalyptic weather, um, then you know may- maybe that would have meant that on a third round, if it was still not ideal conditions, that she would have done well. And I mean, eighty-five percent circle one X putting. It's that's great. Like it's it's good numbers. Uh, you know, she putted well. Stayed out of bounds or stayed out of the out of bounds. And and like you said, it just just played a solid game. The one thing I want to note that I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Missy, but uh, Kristen Tatar in strokes gained T to green was better than Paige Pierce. And I mean, her putting wasn't quite as good, but not much off. I mean, if Kristen Tatar, and I think the numbers look better. I, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at Worlds, but in, in my just a quick recollection, seem better than they did at Worlds. So maybe by the end of the month, I mean, she already got Clash of Canyons. She already has to be thrilled with her, you know, American tour for what she's going to have for this year. But I hope that she just keeps building that confidence because it's it's fun to see her name back at the top again. Well, I mean the the stats look amazing for Kristen everywhere except on the green. Uh, you know, the putting is just not good enough. She was 69% this weekend, which, you know, it's not disastrously bad, but it's not good. Um, Missy Gannon led the tournament at 85%, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, look, d- let me ask you a question. D- does this change in your mind who Missy Gannon is as a player or make you think differently about her game because now that she's won one? No, I I think like you said, it it more than anything kind of cements this. So it kind of cements who Missy Gannon is. It is noteworthy though where she like has played well because you know the, last year when we first started talking about Missy Gannon, I say we, I mean the disc golf world. I wasn't on the upshot yet, but when when we first started talking about Missy Gannon, when you interviewed Missy Gannon. It was right after the Dynamic Discs open, where right after the COVID break, she comes back and takes second. And, you know, now at this course, uh, was it was it uh, Pickland Park? Pickard. Pick, Pickard Park? Pickard Park. That's what it was. Pickard Park. It, it felt very uh, Jonesboro-esque in my mind. I mean, uh, some long fairways, some open fairways, but felt like a disc golf course. And that, that seems to be where, I mean, she plays it well. But she plays best on disc golf courses, I think. So uh, elsewhere, you know, Jessica Weiss having a very good weekend. And, well, I think led the uh, tournament in strokes gained from tee to green with 13. I mean, through two rounds, it's a very good number. Um, couldn't quite do enough around the green and, you know, just took a few too many bogeys, basically. I mean, I, I, OB, probably the biggest story for Jessica Weiss, took four out-of-bounds strokes to Missy Gannon's one. Uh, but a, a strong weekend from her. Are you worried at all about Paige Pierce? You know, I got worried about Paige Pierce earlier in the year, and then she won three in a row. So, uh, no, no, um, I'm not. I think she's coming off... You know, Paul Macbeth comes off of worlds and he comes off of a world where it was pulled out of the basket from him by a a yellow and blue envy. (laughs) And I mean, to no fault of his own in that final round, um, page page is not the same case. And we talked about this. I mean, page lost that tournament 
she was in position. It, she could have at very least made it to playoffs. So, you know, she has to, she has to still have that on her mind. And if it means that she doesn't play great and, and plus the other thing to note, I mean, I think give her a third round and she probably plays better. Um, th- that's the story with Paige and Paul, uh, both. I mean, that's just give them that third round. She was only out of bounds once. It, it, it didn't feel like a Paige esque style of game for the weekend. I mean, usually you see Paige with the higher OB numbers, but then the higher gain T to green strokes. So it, it felt, I don't know, just based on numbers, at least it looks conservative. Um, I'm not terribly worried. I think give her a couple of weeks and I think you're going to see Paige back in, in normal form. Um, Kristen Tatar, Katrina Allen, Sarah Hokum, your next finishers, Juliana Corver, seventh place. All right, let's take a, let's just take a little, little glance over at the standings in the disc golf pro tour right now, because Juliana Corver said that it's her goal to qualify for this golf pro tour championship. And so let's take a look at where we are right now. Juliana Corver in 16th place today. And so that puts her in the championship if the season were to end today. So she didn't play any Pro Tour anything until Goat Hill Silver Series. She's now played five Pro Tour events, um, three Elite Series, two Silver, and has finished inside the top 10 at four of the five and was 12th at Portland. Uh, Juliana Corver, as long as she keeps playing and she's signed up for most of the tournaments down the stretch, she's not signed up for MVP, but otherwise is going to be playing D Glow, Preserve, Ledgestone, Idlewild, uh, Stafford, which is a Silver Series, and the Green Mountain Championships. I mean, she's like, is it is it is it wrong to call her a lock? The way she's been playing. No, no. I mean, if you look at if you look at her standing, she hasn't missed top sixteen once. You know, she's taken twelfth uh, at Portland, and mind you, Portland, right? Like the course that even at OTB that we thought was really long. Portland's like, uh huh. Hold my beer. It's like <laughs> I, I can show you better. And then you know, so sure, Juliana Corver takes twelfth, whatever. But then since then, it's just been playing incredible. She's been playing great. Uh, I I would be very surprised. If she didn't make it, the and and here's here's the reason why. Right now, because it on, on some of the, you look at some of the names behind her, you're like, oh well. I mean, you've got Holly Finley, Alexis Mondahanu, Ella Hansen, Cynthia Ricciotti, Heather Young. I mean, people who could very feasibly catch Juliana Corver, assuming they play well. Uh, but then if you look at some people ahead of her. Owen Scoggins is only registered for two more events on the year. Uh, Rebecca Cox uh, is playing in more tournaments. Uh, Valerie Mandahanu only registered for three more tournaments mm. this year. So just, you know, some of those names above her, I could also see sliding down a little bit. So I, I don't see any reason why Juliana would miss this cut unless a couple players, I mean, by a couple, I mean, probably four players behind her played out of their mind well in order to get ahead of her. Uh, speaking of, let's just take a quick look at the top five. Paige Pierce, Katrina Allen, Jessica Weiss, Kona Panis, Missy Gannon right there in fifth place. I mean, she's really played well this year. That's the thing. Like, this is not an out of nowhere win for Missy Gannon. You know, she's got she's got a podium finish. She's got multiple top four finishes, uh, pretty much all inside the top ten except at the Portland Open. So, going to be fun to see. Juliana Cora, by the way. Sneaky pick to win the Pro Tour Championship. I think the format, mm-hmm. the course, like the North Carolina style, her game, very well suited to that. Do not sleep on Juliana Corver later this year. Uh, you heard it here first. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's take a look over at MPO. Paul McBeth gets the dub. Do, do, do you think, like, what is the situation here? It's kind of crazy that he has won eight in a row following the world championships. What is that about? You know, you said at the beginning of the show, it it was kind of nice to have a weekend where, you know, people came, they showed up, they played. It was just disc golf. Uh, Paul Macbeth doesn't get that memo after worlds, you know? So while everyone else is like, Oh, we're here for a good time. Paul does not hear that. And Paul comes out to win. Uh, I, (laughs) I, 
you know, jo- jokes aside, though, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's that Paul plays, you know, this is at the time of the season when he is most dialed, right? He has spent all this time coming up to Worlds. And remember, I don't think what, if, if I remember the stat right, he hasn't missed top two at Worlds yeah. since 2014. No, I think it's, it's right? so, that. It's like 2011. Okay. So, it, yeah, that, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, he, he comes into this part of the year prepared because this is what he's all about. And so, you know, the week after Worlds, when the stakes don't feel nearly as high, you have Paul Macbeth at the very top of his game. And so, I, I mean, I don't think it's shocking then. that and, and, you know, the second part is Ricky wasn't there. Eagle wasn't there. And, and not to say there weren't. It wasn't a good feeling. There were a lot of good names, but some of those that we also expect to challenge Paul, I imagine not just this year, but in years past, probably take this weekend off. And so I, I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, Paul plays great and then just a little bit softer field and and it sets up well for Paul to create another incredible record. Compelling stuff. I mean, Calvin Heimberg had a crazy final round. Uh, ended up going 13 under. From the chase card card and ended up finishing in second place. I mean, starting to get a little reputation for like catching fire off the chase card. He's going to win one of them. One of these days doing this, you know, he almost pulled it off at USDGC last year. And in a way, he almost pulled it off against Macbeth. But, you know, it was never really in doubt. Um, Macbeth just had to avoid mistakes and he did. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Well, a crazy stretch where he went eight under through uh, seven holes. Here's what I do want to say. Paul Macbeth was ahead by one stroke on hole 17. And then he threw the terrible drive that kicked deep into the woods. And he had a miraculous scramble and a great edge of circle putt. So, I mean, it only shows a par on the on you disc. It was quite the par. He was definitely he looked at he looked he stared down that shot for a long time. And yeah. he's lining it up, and he's lining it up, and he's going with the overhand, and he's lining it up, and then he just throws a dart through a zillion trees and gets it, yeah, to about 30, 30 35 feet, and then hits the putt. Um, I mean, a crazy shot, you know, like oh yeah, champion stuff. Like, mm-hmm. that's the crazy thing. It's like he did that at Worlds 2, and he just took the world's most brutal second place finish because James Conrad hit a miracle. Um, but you know, this is just Macbeth looks dialed right now. Really? Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, he could play even better to be honest. Uh, he had a, he had a very good final round 11 under, um, you know, putting, putting a little below his standards, I think, but you know, scramble was great highlighted by that shot on 17 and, uh, was giving himself a ton of birdie looks. I think he, he led the field by 6%. In getting to circle one in regulation at 67%. Imagine getting to a birdie look on two thirds of the holes inside the circle. I mean, that is just incredible stuff. I think sometimes it doesn't always translate when you're watching the pros like on, on television, like how good they are. Um, like, yeah, sure, you can appreciate it when they throw really far, but it's like, okay, like I could throw that shot. But like, could you get inside the circle on two thirds of holes on a gold layout? <laughs> no, no, maybe ten percent. Um, Calvin Heimberg, you know, plays well again. I, I, it's just interesting with Calvin Heimberg; he just hasn't been able to quite find all the pieces to get the win this season. It's it's honestly it's weird because he's he's been playing uh-huh. so well, and yet just not quite enough. I don't know if there's anything to make of that. I mean, he's been incredibly consistent again this season. And, you know, he, he's going to need to win an event or two if he wants to be in the hunt for player of the year. But I think, you know, if you just look at like average finish, he's probably right at the top. Top three, easy. And and I, I mean, there's two things to note on that. The first of which is I think that there are some good courses coming up for Calvin. I mean, remember his breakout tournament was the Music City Open. So, you know, it's not a pro tour event, but it is an elite series. I think that there are some courses that I expect Calvin Heimberg to play very well at uh, later in the year. 
And the second thing, though, is, I mean, this is Paul, Mc- I, I was shocked when I heard this, but they said it on Disc Golf Network. Uh, this was Paul McBeth's first Elite Series win or Pro Tour win of the season. I don't know if it was Elite Series. They said Pro Tour win. So I'd have to go back and check. But, I mean, that's, you know, so we're over here. We're like, oh, man, Calvin just, you know, needs to string it together. And then you're right. Like, he does. But the fact that, you know, this is Paul McBeth's first as well, I think that should just kind of point out, you know, two things. One, just how 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 competitive the MPO field is. But two, yeah, this is, this is his first Elite Series win. No, he won DDO. Uh, oh, I've got DPT. DDO. Yep, yep, yep. He okay, DDO. he has two. So I was sorry, I was looking at Disc Golf Pro Tour standings. So he gets DDO. Uh, you know, I I think that this should just point out how competitive the MPO field is, but also how well Eagle has been playing on the year as well. Because Eagle's got three wins. And so, you know, but like you said, Calvin... Great average finish. He'll get there. I'm not worried about it. I think he'll do, you know, it, it. maybe it's a Chris Dickerson storyline where it just waits till the end of the year to get hot. I would, if you ask me to put money on it right now as to whether or not Calvin is going to get an Elite Series win this season, I would probably put money on too. him getting an Elite Series win. I think I win. would too. Yeah. Let me ask you this. We're basically at the halfway okay. point of the season. And on Thursday, on our show on Thursday, we're going to come back to our stock picks. We're reopening the market. We're going to take a look at how our portfolio has done since our previous stock picks. And we're going to make some updated picks on Thursday. So we're looking forward to doing that. But as we kind of get ready for the second half, and I know people say like, oh, Worlds marks the second half. For me, the second half starts now because we have this long stretch and now we have a week with no, no nothing, no tournaments. I mean, there's tournaments, obviously, but there's no no Silver Series, no Pro Tour, no National Tour. And then, boom, we hit this big stretch coming up, starting with D-Glow. And also, like, D-Glow is going to have a PDGA Summit. There's going to be some big, deep, important conversations about the future of the PDGA going on. Like, this is the biggest, most important PDGA Summit in, like, 10 years. I, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Um, And so, like... The sport has had all this crazy growth, and it feels to me like this is sort of the natural break point before we then enter what it, I consider to be the second half of the year. I get it. If you want to say it's Worlds, that's fine. But to me, Des Moines Challenge feels a little bit more like it's with Worlds than that it's starting the second half. To each to each their own on this. But anyway, who do you take right now, if the season ended today, who's your MPO player of the year? I, th- I think it has to be Eagle. Like, you know, the world's nod for James is excellent. Calvin and Paul have both been playing really well. Paul's two wins are, are excellent. You know, I, I guess it become, comes into question of how much do you weight Paul's second place worlds or Eagle's third pro tour win, whichever one you want to, you know, say is his third. Uh, we have Portland Open, obviously, by schedule, but you know, whichever you want to list in terms of importance. You know, I think that's kind of the comparison you got to make. Three Pro Tour wins is a lot, uh, you know, but that I think I would probably wait the second place at Worlds higher. Mm. I, I think you have. I think I might say Paul because and, and it's it's also the type of second place, right? It wasn't like Paul coming from 10 strokes back and like losing still by five, like where you're like, yeah, yeah he never had a chance anyway. Like, I, I think. And uh, it's not to say, uh, look, I am the first one to shut down any Eagle can't play in the woods, right? I picked Eagle to win Worlds. I I have long been on that train, even before Worlds. That being said, I think there is some fair questions about the fact that, you know, his three wins are all on golf courses. Paul, you know, playing well, at a, a little bit more variety. I, I think Paul's probably my player of the year, halfway through the year. It, it is. It is close. It is very close. Um, Eagles had a couple clunker tournaments, but he also has the most wins of anybody on tour this year. And look, a win is a win. I, I, I don't. When I start to look at the stats at the end of the year, I'm not looking at what kind of course were they playing on. Like everyone has the same courses to play. You mm-hmm. win, you win. 
So you've got Macbeth now with two Elite Series wins and then the second place finish at Worlds. You have Eagle with the three um, Elite Series wins and, you know, ended up finishing well inside the top 10 at Worlds, but wasn't really competitive to try to do anything at the tournament. So the the, the thing that I... It's hard. Like, I, I think right now it feels like a bit of a toss up. You know, recency bias makes me want to pick Paul. But mm-hmm. I do think, you know, you have to wait wins. We we this is why we, we're lucky we get to wait till the end of the year. Maybe it will become more clear. I think if Eagle wins a major, he's probably going to win it this year. But yeah, that's easier said than done. Well, and, and we can't leave Ricky out. Because Ricky's got two Elite Series wins and two Silver Series wins. So, you know, in terms they all three of those players have two Elite Series wins. But then you have to wait a second place Worlds finish from Paul, a third Elite Series wins from Eagle, or two Silver Series wins from Ricky. Right? And those Silver Series wins, when you look at them, Goat Hill, eh, I mean, there were not a ton. There's some. Open at Belton? Full field. that We, sure. we talked about it. It felt like you know, a pro tour yeah. event. So, uh, you know, I think all three of them have a compelling case for player of the year right now. Um, and I think Calvin Heinberg gets a couple of wins under his belt. Wins. And I think, he, yeah, he, he needs, I think at this point he needs two wins at least to be in the discussion. Reigning ultimate um, disc golf player of the year, Calvin Heinberg. Yes. Um, well, it's going to be fun. I mean, this, this second half is going to be fun. We get a big long stretch of exciting disc golf starting in two weeks. Um, all right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll chat a little bit more about this uh, Don Juan challenge. And we will go inside the circle and then we will sign it off. So stay with us. You're listening to The Upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. You should make sure to follow Pound on all of their social media platforms, especially Facebook and Instagram, so you can find out about the latest drops. They've got a bunch of new bags coming out this month, and the best place to find out when they're coming is on their social media platforms. So give them a follow, Instagram.com slash Pound Disc Golf, Facebook.com slash Pound Disc Golf, and also set your calendars for August 1st when the new custom programs will open once again. Find out more at PoundDiscGolf.com. Joining us now on the Upshot is the Des Moines Challenge champion, Missy Gannon. Missy, welcome back to the program. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Well, we're super excited to have you on. Uh, we, you know, it's the last time we had you on, you, you, were, you almost won a tournament. And now we get to have you on after your first Elite Series win. Uh, you know, you've how it's been less than 24 hours since you you won this thing. Uh, how has have, has it sunk in yet for you? How are you feeling this morning? Yeah, I think I think now it has. Um, you know, I woke up and I kind of was able to go through all of the messages I had and, um, you know, see that final putt all over Instagram and social media and, um, you know, rewatch it. I couldn't help it. It was just one of those, you know, it's one of those moments I'm never going to forget. And uh, so, yeah, I think now it's kind of sunk in, but um, it, it definitely took a, a little while. <laughs> what I, I think you said in your post round interview that you hadn't, you didn't really realize what the scores were, or where things were until that putt and you stepped up to that putt. So at that point, presumably you knew you needed to make that uh, was there some, do you feel any pressure at that point? What was going through your mind? Yeah, it's funny because, um, you know, I've, ne- I've never really been in this position before. Um, you know, maybe for trying to figure out if I'll get my top 10 finish, if I have to make a putt or, um, you know, maybe at us women's, I was trying to get that, that podium finish. And if that was possible, you know what I needed to do. Um, but my caddy and I have never been in the position where, you know, it's for the win. And so we're still trying to figure out, you know, what that dynamic is and whether or not I, you know, should know the scores or should I just, you know, play my game and, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Um, so at that point I knew hole 18 was 
I, I've been, I had been playing that hole for par. Um, it, for me, it's a little bit out of my range. I really need to have three incredible shots to have a, a, a birdie opportunity. And um, I kind of got the vibe that I didn't need to birdie the hole. I just needed to play it clean. Um, and so that, I think if I had to birdie the hole, my caddy Tom would have obviously told me that that's the, what the scenario was because he knew that that was my game plan was to just play that hole for par. So, um, you know, when he was kind of quiet, I figured, okay, just do what I need to do. Um, stick to my game plan. And it wasn't until, uh, Jessica parked her third shot that I looked to him and I said, does that seal the deal? Cause at that point I wasn't sure if that was like, Oh, she's getting a birdie. That's going to like, tie it up or maybe she you know won uh, you know so he said no that doesn't seal the deal and that's all he said at that point that was before I, ha I had sh I had thrown my my fourth shot um and so after I threw my fourth shot and I saw it came up a little bit short but I did see that it trickled past the circle one uh feather flags um I I asked him as we were walking, you know, kind of proceeding down the fairway, um, you know, what, what does that mean? I needed to know at that point, obviously. And he said, and he was, he had a little bit of a tremble in his voice, but he was like, he kind of chuckled a little and he said, if you make it, you win. And I said, okay. Simple and as that. that was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, so was your heart pounding? Sorry, Josh. I'm no, no, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> Was your heart pounding? Well, how are you? Like, what was the, that's such a huge pot, you know, never had one yeah. like this in a big tournament like this. Uh, yeah, I, definitely. I honestly, I was trying to, fig I was trying to recount how I was feeling going into that putt. And I, I honestly don't even, I don't even know. I, I do <laughs> know that I was very, my adrenaline was a little, you know, kicked up. Um, I definitely had some nerves going. Um, but at, in that moment, I, I was just like, okay, it's inside the circle. I had, I got this, like, I know I can make this putt. And honestly, if I, if I didn't, and it had to go to a playoff, you know, that at least I didn't necessarily lose it on that putt. But, um, really all that I was thinking about was putting all of my energy and all of my focus into just calming down, settling into my routine and doing what I had been doing, you know, the whole tournament. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was intense. I have not, I have not felt, uh, those kind of feelings. I don't think ever. So it was, uh, it was a new, a new feeling for me. You mentioned your caddy, Tom, tell us a little bit. Is, is that someone who caddies for you regularly? Um, and, and if so, like, how did that get started? We've, we've interviewed caddies before on, on the show and uh, Haley King specifically, you know, so we're just, uh, we, it's something we're always interested in in terms of the game. So how, who is Tom? How long has he been caddying for you? <laughs> yeah, I, I call him my life caddy. Cause we've been, we, we are actually a couple, uh, we have been together for, uh, 16 or so years. Um, so since, since high school, um, so, you know, we, you know, we, we kind of, we know what we're, what we're thinking, what each other's thinking. We kind of just, you know, we have that, that sort of unspoken, you know, connection. Um, uh, so yeah, he, he started, he, we both actually got into the sport at the same time. Um, him and I moved out to Colorado back in 2014 and uh, our friends had introduced us to the sport and, you know, it kind of, it didn't stick right away. Um, you know, unlike most people's stories, it, it pretty much always sticks right away. But for us, it was, we were, we were trying to figure out, um, you know, our, our living situation and getting new jobs at that point. So it kind of disc golf wasn't really, you know, top of mind back then, but, um, but yes, we are a couple, we are actually engaged. We've been engaged for quite a while. We've kind of put that whole part of our lives on hold so that we can do this whole touring thing. But yes, I am fortunate enough to have a full-time caddy um, on tour with me um, who also happens to be my partner in life. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty great thing to have, uh, you know, have that relationship and just um, have complete trust and faith in one another and be able to play practice rounds together so that we can both kind of understand the courses and the shots that are needed, you know, very, very much like, um, you know, 
traditional golf and and their caddies. Um, so it's uh, I feel like it's definitely an advantage that I've had for my entire career on on tour. So um, yeah, it's uh, it it's yeah, it's just awesome to have um, you know my best friend, my life partner as my caddy as well. I'm sure. And does Tom, so in terms of, you know, he keeps track of score, obviously, but then does he recommend like disc choice, shot choice? Like, oh no, I don't know if the hydra is the best play here. Like what else, d- does that something that Tom is a part of as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, it maybe not all of the time. I think that he, that's mostly in practice rounds, you know, um, obviously I'm not going to land in the exact same spot all, all the time, but um for the most part, we just come up with a really solid game plan. Um, and in practice, we'll say, okay, maybe you should try this. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's not the right, the right disc, or this is the landing zone you want to, you want to, you want to end up in. Um, so we kind of figure that stuff out usually before the tournament rounds actually start, but every once in a while, I'll find myself in a, in an interesting spot or, you know, maybe slightly, um, maybe in a better spot or in a slightly worse spot. Um, and so he kind of can help me uh, talk through those situations. And, um, you know, yeah, it, it, he definitely does recommend uh, discs when I need to. You know, there are some times where I have to scramble and I don't really throw a lot of overhand shots or, or rollers, but he actually um, does or at least understands them a little bit more than me. So he can kind of guide me through those situations if I have to scramble out of the woods or something. But um, but yeah, he he typically just is there to um, obviously carry my bag, but also keep score, keep track of what's going on and, um, you know, keep me calm, make sure I'm drinking water, make sure I'm, you know, uh, eating my snacks or, um, yeah. Uh, and just really to validate my decision. Sometimes I'll get a little bit, uh, maybe a little self-conscious or, you know, it, it, it was our game plan, but then I get a little bit anxious in the moment and I'm kind of like, you know, I'll ask him like, yeah, you're sure. Right. We definitely want to throw this disc. And he's like, yeah, that's, you know, so it's just having that extra bit of um, validation and and confirmation. Speaking of validation, you know, we were talking earlier in the show about how well you've been playing, you know, you've been up in there, top five, regular basis, uh, competitive, but maybe not in the hunt for a a win at a tournament. Mm -hmm. How validating do you feel that getting this elite series win is given how close you've come in the past and, and really how competitive you've been over the last two years. Yeah. It, it, I, I was saying that it feels like a monkey, uh, you know, is off my back. Um, it, it's so hard to be out here on tour. Sometimes, you know, you're, you're just grinding and you're just practicing all the time and you're trying to balance, you know, that work life balance and traveling and, um, you know, maybe trying to do things that aren't just golf related, um, you know, we're so fortunate to be able to travel all around the country and um, to not be able to enjoy uh, parts of the country or be able to do other things outside of disc golf. Um, you know, it, it, we're trying to we're trying to work on that balance a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, being able to finally put the rounds together and, you know, it, it was only two rounds. Uh, typically, it's, it's three or more, but um you know, the weather, weather didn't allow us to play that, that, uh, that third round, but, um, yeah, it it certainly finally feels like, okay, you know, I can, I can do this. A lot of the time I I come out with maybe a round that sort of digs me into a little hole and it's hard for me to get back out of that hole. Um, but I'll come back with two really, really solid rounds and, you know, maybe that'll, that'll earn me that top 10 finish, but I just feel like, man, if that first round was just, you know, on par with what I had shot the last two rounds, maybe, you know, the, I could have had that, that win. So I feel like a lot of times that's what had been happening to me, uh, leading up to this point. Um, so it was nice to finally just shoot pretty consistent and, um, be able to actually fight through a battle in the end and come out on top. What would you consider to be your greatest strengths that help you take down this tournament and are going to help you in future tournaments? Uh, definitely my putting. Um, I, I know I had mentioned that in that, in that last round, I did miss a few, uh, 
uh, that were inside the circle or just around the circle's edge that I could have easily made and would have made my life a lot easier on hole 18. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, the, the previous round, I was 100% inside the circle. And honestly, that was because I didn't really have to putt. I only had a few putts, um, you know, outside of, of 11 feet. And so other than my putting coming in clutch, obviously, late in the round, um, the final round, I, I had been putting my upshots really close or my drives, but mostly my upshots. I feel like a lot of those, um, longer holes, I, you know, was just giving myself easy looks for birdie or, or par on some of the harder ones. So, um, so yeah, I, I think this weekend was definitely heavily, uh, my, my putting, uh, came in clutch, but, uh, definitely my upshots as well. Does it feel like uh, you're left wanting more given that it was only a two round tournament? I mean, does it th does it feel like a full on fully fledged win uh, or do you now think, well, I want to get one where it's three or four rounds? I mean, I don't care. It's a win. So uh, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, you know, we all were, were aware that uh, the final round was going to be the, the final round um, and that we were only going to have those two rounds. So um Honestly, I think this is just uh, just sort of a, a lesson to everybody that you have to just play every round as if it will be the last round because you just don't know um, what the weather's going to do. We we play outdoors, so um, you know, Mother Nature doesn't doesn't play around. So um, yeah, I, I think that yeah, I I I think that this still just gives me that confidence to know that I can come out shooting hot in the beginning and I can finish uh, shooting pretty hot not the hot round but pretty hot and at least hot enough to 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 keep it um keep it going my way so i think that if nothing else it's just going to give me that confidence um going into the next few tournaments and uh to know that i can i can do this and i always knew that i could do this but this definitely solidifies that and um and yeah will help me keep that confidence going when you went into that second round you, Paige, and Kristen were all tied at three under par. Did your game plan change at all, knowing that that was the last round, that you need to play more aggressive or what have you? Uh, no. I think I pretty much played every single hole exactly the same. Maybe I stabled up a, a couple times because it definitely was windier uh, yesterday than the first round. Um, but pretty much exactly the same. And honestly, when I came out, uh, during round one and I shot three under and that was with a bogey. Um, I, nothing felt like anything really went wrong. Um, other than going OB to, to get that one bogey. Um, everything just felt right. And I had played four practice rounds. So I knew that I was prepared. I knew I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, there was maybe one hole, I think it was hole 16 that, that, really technical short downhill hyzer with a lot of OB uh, surrounding the basket. It's just a really strange shot. Um, and so I think I had changed my game plan from round one to, uh, to round two. I ended up getting the same result, but um, for the most part, I, I had thrown both shots in practice and then I kind of, you know, still wasn't really sure what, what I wanted to do on that hole. Um, so that was really the only hole that I, I think I changed up. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just, I, I knew that I could, could go bogey free out there. And I think that that is a, is a, is always an awesome thing to do. Cause you're never going to, you know, lose any of the strokes that you gained, but um, to, to have that confidence to know that I, I can play really clean out there. And I just, if I play my game plan, I'm going to come out, you know, without too many mistakes and without too many bogeys and um, you know, with, with, a few boat birdies under my belt. So yeah, it was a solid game plan and I'm glad that it worked out. I'm sure it, it sucked because of the weather, you know, causing mm -hmm. all kinds of delays and there was crazy hail and thunderstorms and everything else. Uh, what did you think of the course Pickard park? And, uh, you know, this is a new, new stop on the disc golf pro tour, per perhaps a temporary stop. I guess we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, but this replacing, you know, part of the European swing, curious for your thoughts on this course and then secondarily like maybe looking back to what we've done so far on tour and where we're headed out to the east coast 
just you know general thoughts on the landscape of the uh, courses on tour this year. Yeah, I loved it, and I think there were nothing but positive uh, feedback uh, for this course from a lot of the pros. I think that it just it felt like a course. It felt like it was made for us. You know, there it there was really nothing else out there. Maybe a, a couple of baseball fields, but nothing you know in uh, on the track other than the disc golf course. And it just felt like everyone wanted us there, and um, you know, I think it had a little nostalgia with worlds having been there in the past. And, um, you know, it just, it had all the shots. It had, um, forehands, backhands. It had, it gave you several different opportunities and different ways to get to, um, to work your way down the fairways. So I think that that's, that's all that we can ask for as uh, professional disc golfers, having options and being able to showcase our, our game. Um, so I hope that it's, I hope, hope that it stays on tour i think that i feel like it will um i don't have any inside information but just based on all of the feedback and um i talked to the parks director afterwards he came up to me to congratulate me and um he was really excited to have us all out there and uh he you know seems like he has a great relationship with with the the local disc golf club that helps out at that course so um you know it always feels good when everybody wants us to be there and wants, um, wants disc golf to be, uh, you know, a major part of their, uh, you know, their hometown. So, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's awesome. And I think, I think that we'll, I think we'll see it on, on tour coming up, but I, I loved it. I think that it was a great segue into coming to the East coast. It's sort of, you know, a little more wooded, a little more humid, a little bit more uh, green. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm I'm actually originally from New York, so I love I love the East Coast and I love that kind of golf. So uh, yeah, I hope I hope to see it again, and uh, I definitely will be back to defend my title if it is. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, I'm curious, you know, your thoughts on. The, I feel like I remember you posting something on Instagram during U.S. Women's. Uh, with some issues with the way that things were playing out there. You know, Paige Pierce was very vocal, some other players as well. Um, I may be misremembering, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and then, you know, Worlds, there's just been some controversies this year over the past few weeks vis a vis, you know, the PDGA and operations of the majors. Uh, just curious for your take on things. And, you know, that, but now that we have some distance from those events, how you feel like th- those played out? Yeah, I, you know, I think that. I think that honestly, the the disc golf pro tour is just setting uh, a whole new standard uh, for us when it comes to payouts, when it comes to hearing the players out and taking their feedback and actually implementing um, some of the things that they hear from us and just being so transparent with us. And um, I think that they're just setting a precedence that uh, is taking the sport to a whole new level. And I think that we got so used to that, especially since last year, we only had the disc golf pro tour, you know, after, after everything kind of took a pause and then uh, the disc golf pro tour did anything that they could to make sure that we could still do our jobs and have a way to make money. You know, this is our livelihoods and um, none of us really knew what we were going to do after, you know, the, the whole tour ended. Um, And so for them to take that, proactive approach to you know figuring out protocols and making sure that we can still continue in a safe way um was you know i think just a big statement you know and so when we got back on tour and it you know we were all so excited to be back out there and doing what we love um they then we come to 2021 and everything's kind of back to, to normal. The, all of the, the NTs are back pretty much and um, the majors and the disc golf pro tour, obviously. And uh, maybe, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say we were spoiled, but I do think that the disc golf pro tour decided to, um, you know, take their own path and, and um, take initiative to make these events bigger and better and, um, obviously the, also the local, the local crews that they're working with, um, are, have a play a big role in that as well. But I, I think it all just comes down to communication 
And I think that maybe even with the year that the PDGA kind of took off from the professional side of things, um, set them back a little bit, possibly. I don't know. Um, and that's the problem. I don't, I don't know. And, and maybe there's more ways I can get involved in the PDGA to find, to find out more information or to be more aware of what's going on in that, in the organization. But, um, with the disc golf pro tour, I don't have to, it's all, they're, 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 they're just so transparent and they keep us in the loop before things are even, um, posted anywhere or officially, you know, an email officially gets, uh, gets blasted out there. They, they, we almost know before that even happens. So yeah, I think that if, if more of the touring players can be involved in the organizations that are running events um, in some way, you know, we're, we're happy to do that. We're always happy to give feedback and um, you know, it's not complaining. We just wish that people kind of were more proactive in finding out what we thought, you know, or what, what we, how we feel about, uh, certain things, um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, we're the ones doing, getting the PDJ's name out there, doing what we're doing and having the coverage on us and, um, uh, yeah. And just spreading, uh, the, the, spreading the disc golf, uh, the good word of disc golf. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but, <laughs> but you know, like, I, I, yeah, I, we're, we're working so hard out here to, put on a show and to, you know, we love the sport and we just, we we're happy to be involved in any way that we can to make sure that the sport looks and feels and is represented in um, a professional way. I, I'm curious if you feel the growth of the sport when you're out there playing. Yeah, I definitely do. And I think especially with the, ability for spectators to be back out there. Uh, I mean, Iowa was out there in full force this weekend, regardless of what the weather was doing, they were, they were out there and, um, you know, we're so thankful to have, uh, spectators back and, um, you know, I'm sure people didn't know who I was and now they do, or, you know, what, you know, whatever it just, I think that both in terms of the turnout, uh, you know, spectator passes being, um, sold out for so many of these events that we've been having, um, as well as, you know, the multi, uh, media coverages that were, that were having, um, so many more crews are coming out to film and coming on tour full time. It's, uh, you definitely can feel it. And then also, you know, this was one of the highest disc golf pro tour payouts, uh, I think ever. So, um, yeah, at I least saw that. Did you, did you, the, how yeah. much did you get? 4,000? Four thousand for yeah for FPO first place. I mean that's that Jeff Spring. Other than the Disc Golf Pro Tour Championships, that's that has been one of the biggest payouts for a Disc Golf Pro Tour Elite Series event. So um, that again just speaks to sponsors getting involved and and all of that. So uh, definitely feel feel the growth and really happy to be a part of it. In terms of the rest of the season, which event are you looking forward to most and which one do you feel like, and maybe this is a separate question, but which, which one do you feel like is going to best suit your game for the chance to take your second title as well? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I'm, I always look forward to going to Michigan, which will be our next stop um, and playing D glow just because it's the land of disc, disc craft. And I can, you know, see all of my, uh, my teammates and my team managers and all of that. So uh, it's always fun to go back to go back there and, and hang out. And, you know, everybody loves Discraft in Michigan. So having those fans out there is awesome. Um, I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, what event I might have the best chance of winning next, uh, probably maybe, maybe D glow, but it's a, it's a big, it's a big track. And uh, you know, we'll see maybe, maybe if I can get it done, that'd be awesome. But um I think I always look forward to Idlewild. I think because it was my first stop when I first came out on tour in 2018 and it kicked my butt and it kicked my butt again in 2019, <laughs> 2020, finally, like I, I took fifth place and I, I knew that I could, you know, I left a lot out there. So it was just such a big contrast. And I, I just, that was one of the courses that I, 
I would go back out after I finished my round and practice again. And that doesn't happen very often. I'm, I'm not that kind of person. I usually will get my, get my practice rounds in before the event starts and try to get a solid game plan and then, and then play. But it's just one of those challenging courses that you just, yeah, it just leaves, leaves more to be desired, you know, after my round and I wanted to go back out there and, and play again. And, um, so that would be really cool. It's, it's super technical. I think that it, it, it's really good for the entire field. Cause you know, there are long shots. There are, there are more open shots, mostly wooded shots. Um, so that would be a cool one. I think to, to take down just because it is one of the harder tracks that we play on tour. So, uh, yeah. And then I always love, the Northeast, because again, that's where I'm from and it's a great part of the year to be up there. Um, it's getting a little cooler, but, and, uh, yeah, so I'm just looking forward to this whole next half of, of tour really. <laughs> awesome. Well, your, your, your bank account is $4,000 fatter. Uh, did you get to do okay. anything fun to celebrate last night or today? Actually, right after the round, uh, I, we went out, uh, myself, Tom, Paige, and uh, Leah, she's an OTB uh, teammate of ours. We all went out to get some Mexican food and just sort of hang out for a little bit. And I was really, really tired. I think mentally, <laughs> mentally, I was just completely done for. Um, so honestly, after we had a nice little dinner, I we came home. Uh, home back to our camper uh and uh watch some of the men's live coverage for their third round and just hung out and just yeah just chilled and took it all in and yeah nothing too crazy i'm not really a partier by any means um but yeah it was it was a nice way to kind of just hang out after the round and awesome soak it, it, was, all in. it was very cool watching Paige. she pulled her phone out and was filming your uh your final putt there i'm sure she showed you uh, yeah. it's cool to see her get excited yeah. for you mm -hmm. yeah she's uh she's my number one fan and my number one competitor too so you know it's always, it's always yeah it's always good to you know kind of vibe with her and um you know unfortunately she wasn't able to put the round together that she would have liked but um not unfortunate for you <laughs> I, 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 no for sure i mean yeah I, if any if there was anybody that i thought i was gonna be battling with it was it was her but um i you know just just put the pedal to the metal in the end and made some clutch uh clutch shots and uh fortunately i had a, a few strokes to to hang on but um but yeah Paige is Paige is a, a good friend to have and i've been learning a lot from her, her and I practiced with her one round, uh, before this event and, um, yeah, uh, we're always going to root for each other and we're going to be happy regardless of, of what happens. Awesome. Well, Missy Gannon, thank you so much for stopping by and, uh, congratulations again on, on getting your first elite series win. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the upshot. Josh, I told you, James Conrad, just going to be chilling. It's just going to be chilling post worlds. Chalk it up over under. I'm a, I take the lead three, two. All right. I, I do want to say oh, it was okay, so close. It oh, was okay, so yeah, it was close. close. Look, if Ben Calloway had, had not decided to birdie three of the last four holes, when he was back tied with seventh, so was James Conrad. It's like he was in seventh. So I blame Ben Calloway. Ben Calloway is the reason I lost this over under. And I knew I should have set the line at top 10. But you know what? It, it was a good line. It was a good line. It was close. So close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Yeah. By the way, I bet on the Bucks Suns under. 222 and a half and that last second meaningless three from the Suns that just barely missed long was the reason that I won that bet and that's sometimes that's how it goes sometimes that's how it goes. Goes. sometimes it goes in sometimes it doesn't <laughs> sometimes Ben Callaway birdies the last three holes sometimes he doesn't <laughs> so anyway uh let's talk a little bit about a couple of guys up at the top of the leaderboard in MPO uh Raven Newsom. Finishes in fourth. Gavin Rathbun finishes in third. At some point, 
we got to acknowledge that these guys are killing it and that like are we seeing some like next generation going to start winning tournaments soon potential here i mean i i feel like gavin rathbun particularly has kind of been hanging around the top 10 quite a bit this season he absolutely has. And in fact, if you look at the Pro Tour standings, Gavin Rathbun is in 11th place right now, ahead of our, I think I would say, probably most talked about, most noticed young prodigy, Kyle Klein, who's in 12th place. So, you know, we talk a lot about how well Kyle Klein's playing, um, and, and he is. I mean, absolute credit to Kyle Klein just in Pro Tour standings, though. I mean, Gavin Rathbun's been playing excellent. So, and then Raven Newsome. Um, I saw him on here 21st in disc golf pro tour standing. So, I mean, they're, they're playing well. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say that they take over, you know, that they're, they're going to be challenging for the win week in and week out, at least not yet. I mean, cause remember, and, and this not is something yet. that you think they are. No, not yet. Oh, not yet. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, wow, that's that is quite that, the bold, be a bold take, there. take. That would be a very bold take. Um you know, Gavin Rathbun had fifty percent circle two putting, so did Raven Newsome. Like I it's great circle two putting. Uh, I don't know how sustainable that is. Uh, I don't know if they do that every week. Um they're great players. And I think in a couple of years you're gonna see them consistently challenging for the win. I think that I wouldn't be shocked if both of them challenge or even took a win later in this year. Uh, but if you look at their results, they're very up and down. They're young players, and I think they just need some time to play and develop. Going to be fun to see what they can do as uh, things move forward. And, you know, you, you, you kind of it's easy to get attached to a certain name and be like, wow, you know, this is the next big thing. I mean, that happened with Kevin Jones, and he kind of delivered. You know, he, he, he's on that level. Uh, Kyle Klein feels like somebody to me who's going to be coming up to that level. You know, Gavin Rathbun, I want to see it for a couple of years. You know, we've seen it for two seasons now with Kyle Klein, which isn't that long. But Rathbun really feels like he's kind of come out of nowhere this season and established himself. Newsom's still on the come up. Lots of exciting young talent. And how many players like that? I saw a comment online. It was like. No way disc golf is in the golden age, given how many people have started playing in this like last two years and what that's going to mean for like five to 10 years from now. And that's a pretty good argument, to be honest. Like, it's very possible we're going to look back and be like, wow, like the Macbeth Waisaki era was that was really cool. Like those guys were, you know, the forebearers of the future. You know, the way we talk about Climo, uh, and obviously it's far more competitive these days than it was in the Climo days, but it's still, you know, there's really only five, six players who you really feel like on a regular basis can win tournaments. And if you look at the PGA Tour, there's 20. Um, so I, I'll be curious to see if, if as the, you know, the base of the sport has it, it has and will continue to broaden as players filter into the top ranks in the elite game. And it gets harder and harder to become, you know, to, to be out there on tour. If you're not a super elite player, I'm going to be excited to see what happens. But I, I, I kind of buy that argument that like, as good as things seem right now, we have a better future in store as courses improve as the quality of players from one to 50 at a tournament gets way better. Uh, I, I think things could be pretty exciting because don't forget, like you still have people coming in having barely played at all before in their life, like a Brody Smith and finishing in the top 25 on a regular basis after like a year of playing, like how many players like that are showing up right now that we haven't heard of yet. That's a real thing that's happened. Speaking of players who are going to show up in the future and be competitive, the Junior World Champions have been crowned. Let's go inside the circle and talk about some of this week's news. Well, as you said, Charlie, we'll start off with the top of the with the top of the Junior World Championship. 
our boy Cade Philomahala pulls it off, wins no. by nine strokes. Wasn't in he junior down boys by like ten under. strokes? After round two, he was down by ten strokes and came back. And uh, you know, and, and granted, you got to remember, Junior Worlds is six rounds and a final nine, uh, so long tournament. But Cade Philomahala wins by nine strokes in Junior Worlds. You know what, Cade? Congratulations! You can start cashing in on those checks you win and open. So, wouldn't be surprised to see him on the pro tour more often now that this kind of part is finished. So, in junior girls, there was quite the battle. Melody Castorita takes it at twenty eight under par, but Stacy Haas shooting a twenty six under par with a nine ninety six rated round Ooh. in round five. So, I mean, and Stacy Haas only a member of the PDGA since twenty nineteen. Wow. So another example of players not playing as long, I would not be surprised to see. I mean, after that, I think uh, third place was 39 strokes behind Stacey Haas. Unreal. So, yeah, I mean, those I, are two names to follow. Those are two names to follow. Melody Castrita has now won two Junior Worlds in a row in the uh, Junior 18 division. Yeah. So keep your eye on both of them. In Junior 15, Luke Taylor wins it by one stroke at 60 under par. Before Junior. you move on, yes. before you move on, we got an email about Luke Taylor. Okay. What's email, what does that email say? Luke Taylor, we, we talked briefly about the current standings of uh, Junior Worlds last week when it was under, you know, sort of a couple rounds in. And uh, Don emailed in to let us know that we should have talked about Luke Taylor. He's from Michigan. And uh, Don had seen him play at the Michigan Junior State Championships. And at 14 years old, he competed at Deglo last year and finished four under par, which was good for 73rd place, two strokes behind Jeremy Colling and Casey White, one stroke behind Brody Smith and one stroke ahead of 2018 world champion, Greg Barsby. So it goes to show you, you know, th these aren't just like kids who are like playing in their fun little junior world championships. We're talking about players who could go out at, at two elite series events and like beat touring pros. So shout out to Luke Taylor. Another, I mean, still under 15. I mean, he must be 15 now. Uh, somebody to keep an eye on. Quick quick question, side note. How old is Gannon Burr? Isn't he only 15? I, I don't know, but young. Yeah, and Gannon Burr finished 12th this weekend at Des Moines. So, I mean, I think that just proves your point about how well these young players are going to... I mean... Law, they're going the, the days of the Ezra Aderholds who walk on in two years and then find themselves competitive at the Pro Tour. Those days are coming to a close quickly. Hmm, interesting. I don't know if I buy that. I think there's Ooh. always going to be room for people. Like if you took an NFL quarterback and you're like, hey, here's a bunch of discs, learn how to play. I think that they could go out there and be immediately competitive. Hmm. Uh, and that's going to be true for some time. I, for For one, I think there's like, kind of like a natural ceiling on what you can do. Like if you can throw it really hard and then you practice to learn how to throw it straight and controlled, you can compete like at the professional level in disc golf. Uh, and like, I know it's easier said than done, but like Brody's a perfect example. Like you can just, and maybe Ezra is as well. You know, you can throw it hard. You can throw it far. All right. Welcome to the pro tour. You can finish inside the top 10. So, I think that 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 era is not done yet. I don't think we're to the point where like the kids who are getting who are playing for five or ten years are getting that much better that it's over. But I do think that the the kids are coming. Okay, okay. I'm interested. We'll have to talk about this more later because yeah, I'm interested to have this discussion. Well, well here we are. Let's do it really quick. All right, all right. We're stepping I... outside of the circle for a moment. <laughs> put put your mini down. We're coming back. <laughs> um. Here, here's my thoughts uh, in terms of that. I mean, look at look at Brody. I think Brody's a great example because Brody comes from frisbee sports, right? So it's sure. not not even just NFL quarterback, but but comes from frisbee sports. You know, top twenty five. I think that the skills that'll be required and the level of play is going to become so high that yeah, you can come on and you can place top you know thirty, top fifty maybe for Ezra. But I don't think you see Ezra challenging for second place in, I would say, five years. Like, I, I, I think five years from now, 
you will not be able to have been playing disc golf for less than three or four years and be in the top 10, top 25, even regularly. I guess the question is just how long is it going to take for us to get to that point? I mean, I, I think one thing I will say, the level of putting required to be competitive is going to go increasingly higher. Mm-hmm. I, I think people get away with, I mean, look at FPO. Like, th- think about how much has, has changed in FPO. A couple of years ago, you could putt 80% and you'd be like best in the division. Mm-hmm. Now that number is like 88% or something from inside the circle. Like the bar is going up fast. Now there's some ceiling. Like I, I think we've probably seen about what the max level is in, in in MPO. You know, the I think at the end of the year, the top players are finishing around 92, 93%, which, you know, I always do this. You know, it compares a little bit to free throws in the NBA. Feels like a similar thing where it's like you should be able to make it. It's right there. Just put it in. And even Steph Curry misses free throws. Not mm-hmm. often, but he does. And so he finishes the year around that mark, 92, 93%. So I don't know how much higher that's going to get, but circle two putting is that's where we're going to yes, see I think major, so. major, I don't want to say innovation necessarily, but people are going to just ha- have to get more competitive from that distance. Um, and that's where you know, you're going to start seeing numbers in the 40 to 50% range for the best players. And that's where the, the, the time on the course comes into play. Because like, you know, Brody, for example, he's a good circle one putter. He's 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 solid. You know, he's he's got that repetition, Mm -hmm. but he's not good from circle two. No. And it takes years to get good from circle two. And that's where I think you could see the kids start to have that advantage. I mean, I could go if I practiced for three years and shot free throws every single morning, I could be a pretty okay free throw shooter. Like not great. Like obviously not NBA level, but like I could, I could shoot okay at free throws. If I did that for three pointers, doesn't matter. There's no hope for me. (laughs) Like, and and, you know, so I think, I think that's kind of an an equivalent. It, it, and I think when you have players who have had their, you know, same putters and been doing circle two putting for Luke Taylor, for example, in the next five years, been I don't know how, you know, how old Luke is right now or how long he's been playing, but you got to imagine those circle two putts, being able to read the wind, to know, be able to, you know, any circle two putts and just crazy things I think are going to be possible. Uh, I think, I think that the other thing besides circle two putting that I think is probably going to bode well for your argument is I think that we need to get an evolution of courses that are designed, oh, yeah. like you said, to challenge, you know, we talked about this with worlds designed to challenge an entire level of like different skill set. So that if you can't throw a flip up forehand, there are two holes that you are just hosed on. If you can't throw a forced flex backhand, there are two holes that you're just hosed on. And once you do that, then I think it, you have to be a long-term player in order to be really successful. Let's step back to the mini. We're going back inside the circle. Aria Castorita. We assume sister? Definitely sister. Okay. 25 under par. Sorry? Sister of Melody. There's three Castorita sisters. Yes. Haley took third. Haley Castorita took third in Junior Girls 15. But Aria Castorita, 25 under par, second place, six over par. So congratulations to Aria Castorita. Great weekend. Stressful in the final round. You know, (laughs) got to make this putt. I think I she could have by thirty. I think she could have not showed up almost and still won. <laughs> I'd have to do the math. It's it's close though. Um, junior to boys twelve and under. Wyatt Mahoney wins at thirty under par. Junior girls twelve under par. Ava Meyer wins at thirty four under par. Junior ten and under boys. It's just crazy to me how many divisions they have. It's so it's cool. amazing. It's it's, amazing. it's so cool. Uh, junior boys. By the way, Wyatt under. Mahoney threw a 9.75 rated opening round at age. I don't know how old he is. Eleven or twelve, probably. Wow. Charlie, have you ever thrown a 9.75 rated round? I haven't. I have not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it would insane. be it would be humbling to go out there and get whooped by a twelve year old. <laughs> um, junior boys ten and under, a field that had twenty four players in it, which is just wow. so many to me. Gabriel Anderson, four under par. 
Junior girls 10 and under. MJ Gager wins at 72 over par. And then junior boys 8 and under. That that's that's a division. They go so far on these. Incredible. Nathan Brewer wins at 15 under par. Good for you, Nathan. Good round. 15 over. Or 15 that's, over. I, Thank you. 15 over. Yes. I, I was like, wow, 15 under. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rated 677. Shot an 817 rated opening round. Let's go, Nathan. Exciting. There's so many players. I mean, it, it, this it, this tournament gets bigger every year. Awesome to see. Congrats to all the champions. Next up on Inside Circle, PCS Sula Open. Blair Asgerson from Iceland takes down the win. One by seven qualifies strokes. Qualifies for USDGC. Yes, qualifies for USDGC along with the four players behind him. So, you know, congratulations to all those players. I'm interested to see how many of them are able to make it out. Uh, and you know, Charlie, I I didn't realize just how big disc golf is in Iceland. I have to be honest. So, uh, yeah, and, and Blair's Blair. I, I don't know if I can say with certainty that he's the best player in Iceland, but it's the name that I know. So I think so. Um, and then over in open women, open women, uh, an, uh, Anakin, a- Anakin Steen. I apologize if I pronounce that improperly. Uh, Anakin Steen from Norway takes down the win. Um, it, definitely a smaller field in open women, but still congratulations to Anakin. All right. Finally, last point on inside the circle, Brian Schweberger is the second player ever to get to 300 career wins, PGA sanctioned events, behind, a couple weeks behind, Elaine King, who did it first. So congratulations to both of them on our, what are incredible career milestones. Uh, awesome to see Schwebby get to 300. Um, Jeremy Colling on Instagram, when, when Schweberger posted about getting to 300 wins, was like, well, L- Elaine King beat you to it. So who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag race to 400. So that'll be cool. Can one of them get to 400? I wouldn't be shocked. Disc golf that, lifers. Disc golf lifers. And that's what we got for Inside the Circle, Charlie. All right. Well, that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stock picks coming up on Thursday. So take a look. Print out the markets. Get a look at your indicators, your charts. We're going to be reading the tea leaves and we're going to be placing our bets, allocating our portfolio on Thursday. So thank you for joining us. For Josh, I'm Charlie saying so long and we'll talk to you next Thursday right here on The Upshot. <laughs>